I get their idea of what it is. And those are really, the, when you think about it, those are the beginners because when they go and show the application, they're going to show it from the standpoint of showing it to a person from a sales point of view. So they're only going to see it once. So they're going to show it to somebody. So what they want as goals in the application that they're asking for are more of a beginner type of scenario. And then you, ask, you, you do a lot of talking to what we call subject matter experts, which are the people that live and breathe inside of this application, whether it be a legacy or whether it be a large enterprise, whatever it is. They live and breathe. They know it in and out by the back of their hand. So when they say, when we, come, when we start interviewing them, their answers are going to be very much geared towards what an expert would want in the application. So as you can see, you get in the dilemma when you actually go and interview people or get information, you kind of are stuck in these two areas. So you really have a hard time trying to figure out what does that intermediate user really want. Obviously, you don't want to neglect beginners. You don't want to neglect experts. But you don't want to make that your entire focus. So the most important thing you can do is interview the actual user of the application. So that's going to give you your professional intermediate user. So if you're going to do an employee application, interview the employees that are actually doing it, like that trading example I said. Or if you're doing a consumer application, that's a little bit more broader. You can get some consumers pretty readily. Um, so that's a very important piece of figuring out the types of users you have from a research standpoint. So this is a little example from um, a research, kind of some of the deliverables that I do personally on a lot of different projects. And sometimes we share this with clients, sometimes we don't. And sometimes we share it a lot internally from a design standpoint, design studio um, review and stuff. But in immersing yourself in an industry. So let's say uh, this is for... Uh, Let's say we're doing an application for a hotel and search application you want to build. So, I mean, I know a little bit about hotel and search, but I'm going to do a little research on that. So what I'm going to do is try to immerse myself in the industry as much as possible. I should say online hotel flight search application. So what I did, I went to all these different sites, and I started taking these basically screenshots of all the applications that I could find and do quite a bit of research and figure out how they do certain things. But this collage allows me to put this up in my room or my office and I can do um, several different collages. So I'm always focused on what maybe some competitive research might be doing. And of course, clients, when they come to us, they always want the most innovative application. And they think you can just pull it out of the sky and create some magnificent application that nobody else used. So we always have to try to do competitive research to figure out what it is in the industry and then go from there. We don't want to get too crazy, obviously. Uh, so we create these college, the collage boards and, and try to get into many <coughs> demos as you can. A little, a little fun trick you can do if you're doing an um, application that some other people kind of have and they, they kind of do, um, <clears throat> kind of build an application that's based on something else or want to create something that's better than somebody else's. I always go in and pretend I'm somebody else and I log in and I say, hey, I want to see your demo. And you can set up a demo for somebody's, you know, not really, this is a very good example, but for um, maybe a more sophisticated demo that's not online, you just can't readily see, you can sign up for it or call them and say, hey, can you do a demo for me? And just pretend you're somebody else. So you always can try to come in at a different angle and see these demos and get immersed into the industry as much as possible. So like I said, from a financial you know, industry standpoint, like I'm not a broker dealer. I don't know how to manage money, other people's money very well. Obviously, my, not even my own. My wife takes care of me, all that stuff. But um, so I'll go in and pretend I'm a, 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 a a broker person, I'll see their application, let's say, and I'll pretend I'm that person. So to be able to see and get information from a different point of view. So, but these collages are really work really well, um, just being able to have reference and be able to give that information to you while you're doing the entire project. So that was research. Now we're at the next stage, um, creating personas. And personas are a little, little bit weird to understand. It takes a little, once you understand them, they're fairly understandable, but... Um, so basically, this is like the definition of what a persona is. Um, and I'm not going to read it all, but you kind of see that basically it, it just provides a target information of what um, a user would do. And it, you can create several different personas for an individual project or an individual application. But what you create the personas based on is all the research that you did. So you, wanna, you still want to create a very real person, but it has to be more or less fictitious. That way you don't relate it back to... Susie, that was an actual trading person, because then you give her direct information, which you don't want. You don't want to take a combination of the entire trading group, create a persona based on the whole entire trading group, but give that person a real personality. So that way you can take that as a persona is the trading environment. Maybe it's a different group inside of the company that's a different persona. So when you build this application, you can target it to that persona. 
So what personas are is they're drawn from actual field research, like I said before in these other slides. Um, and what you want to do is actually give that persona a fictitious name uh, and a picture. I'll show, I got an example I'll show you in a second. And you want to try to basically break down persona in a couple categories. So you give uh, an image or basically a picture so you have a face, a personality, you give them a name. And what you try to do is give them a real quick background of what the person um, does from their description standpoint, who they are. Um, and then you identify what their goals are. And then that's basically what wraps up a persona from deliverable standpoint. But it's all got to be typical and believable from the standpoint of, you know, this is a real person. Um, and obviously you can grab a lot of different information from us, like I said before. All the research information plays into this from the standpoint of if you're doing analytics, all the different types of user research. So it, 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 quite a bit of information can go and dive into this um, persona. The one thing that they're not, and this is what gets kind of confusing, is that when people start creating personas, or, and I'm sure a lot of you are part of the agile process, and this rolls into the user stories and stuff, and I'll show a context scenario which is very similar to user, user scenario, or I'm sorry, user story. Well, what they're not is they're not based on demographics or market segments. So it's not the marketing research, it's not the, the um, just the, alone the demographics. That rolls into the persona, but it's not just those. And it's not, the one thing it's not, it's not drawn from just basically um, maybe what I think this persona should be. It's based on the research. So you want to try to remove yourself from um, and you want to get away from obviously doing stereotypes from like the whole you know, soccer mom or whatever it is and try to get away from those. Because you want to make it as believable as possible. So this is a little um, example of what a persona is. This was kind of a little verbose. And it, could be very, it could be much shorter than this. Um, so obviously we have a picture of the person. Uh, we have their name. We kind of give them an age. You know, even give them a fake email address. And then we go through and this is kind of what their description of what they are related to the application is being um, a financial institution application. So basically we just give a little background. So we know what their life is like a little bit. And this is just a combination of all the research from several, it could be a persona that was created by interviewing 20 different people. So now we have a little bit of background of exactly what this individual needs to do on a day-to-day -day basis to do their financial transactions. Um, and then we also have listed in the bottom is their goals. So he basically wants to organize his business finance, pay out his expenses, and quickly see his account balance. And, he, and obviously he's like every user, he doesn't want to feel stupid. So now that's being said from a user, this is a user persona. Now when we talk about um, context scenarios or these user stories, you can have just this one persona. You can create 20 different scenarios for this person because they could be in different different avenues of, of their description of their background. So we take that persona, and this is just, just, just this one context scenario, which basically is just a, a narrative description of the persona using a, a specific product. So now we're actually into the realm of figuring out what they're going to do inside of an application, not being technically specific. We're not saying, oh, this is a flex application, or this is a, a button that does this, and it's going to slide in. Just in general terms, how they're going to approach a particular scenario. So they want to go in, and he wants to do is basically go and see his account and see how his trend uh, is uh, maybe move some money around in his accounts. So basically, this goes through the steps of how he'd approach that. So he wants to go into his online bank, see his current account balance, transfer his funds. He logs into his online bank. So it's very, it's, it's enough to show you the process, but they want to do it, but it's not specific on how he does it. So this now gives you these personas that allow you to take these and create actual wireframes, which is the next step, if I turn this around here. So you take those user scenarios that you've created, and now you can start actually building some information based on those. And these are wireframes and affinity charts. Let me get the wireframes here first. Um, so this is just a picture of um, somebody doing some wireframes on this crap paper. It's kind of an interesting thing. If you ever do user interviews or and you're on site, I do this a lot. Um, it could be a couple of different ways. So some of the tricks that I do is if they're, you get into a room and you can go in and do the whiteboards. So you have tons of different whiteboards. You can work with the clients and if you have the availability of other developers, subject matter experts, or just other designers in the room, you can start drawing these wireframes on, on the whiteboard, obviously. And you can start doing a whole bunch of different scenarios with the wireframe, wireframes based on those personas and based on those um, user scenarios. And then what you can do is you can take pictures of those um, with a camera, phone, or whatever you want to do. So you take pictures of wireframes that are on the whiteboard. And you can take that back 
when you go back to your office or your or your 